clinical students. Um, he uh, did his undergraduate at the University of Washington, where he worked with uh, Dr. John G uh, Gutman and became very interested in facial uh, expression analysis and uh, the heads moved here to work with uh, Dr. Jeff Cohn and the uh, Affect Analysis Group. And he has very kindly agreed to present some of his current research to us today. So it's always a pleasure to welcome one of our own students to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to, if I can, stand here. Can anyone hear me? Or can everyone hear me? Okay, good. If it starts to uh, get a little low, just let me know and I will project more. Uh, so I'd like to present today some research that we've been working on recently uh, in our lab on sort of the intersection of uh, clinical psychology and computer science, which I think is a very exciting new field of work that we call uh, affective computing. Uh, and this, uh, the title of this talk today that we'll be presenting uh, actually at the Face and Gesture uh, conference soon is uh, Social Risk and Depression. Evidence from manual and automatic facial expression analysis. And so, I'll go through each of these parts, and hopefully, by the end of it, you'll know exactly what that means and why we decided to name it that. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk about uh, just major depressive disorder, depression uh, in general, to sort of set the stage for this. Uh, major depression is, uh, I think, a really important thing to study, um, both because it's very common and it's very debilitating when it does happen. Uh, so sort of the hallmark features are depressed mood and anhedonia, which is this sort of real diminishing of uh, pleasure and interest in things that would normally be pleasurable and interesting uh, if you were not depressed. Uh, and they can also have some wide-ranging uh, other effects on appetite motivation, behavior, and cognition. So things like change in your appetite and ability to, um, to eat, uh, your energy level, uh, your ability to sleep, uh, the amount of sort of psychomotor um, agitation or retardation, like how much you're moving around or fidgeting. Um, some things like uh, worthlessness, um, indecisiveness or uh, lack of concentration, uh, and recurrent uh, thoughts of death or suicide. Um, so there's many things that this can affect, uh, none of which are particularly pleasant. Uh, and when it does happen, uh, which depending on um, how you look at this, um, anywhere between um, or, and sometimes you see even as high as 10% of people will be affected by depression in any given year. Um, and then if you look at the course of a person's entire life, uh, it's around 7% of people will be affected by uh, at least one major depressive episode. So this is actually quite common to a room full of 100 people. Uh, you know, again, seven of them will be affected by this at least once in their life. So there's a very good chance that you guys have either struggled with this yourself or have a loved one that has done so. Uh, and when it does happen, uh, could be very, very uh, impactful. Uh, so if we had here on this graph um, sort of a survey of common um, mental disorders and what their sort of quality of life loss is. So the higher this bar is, sort of the more debilitating it is to you, uh, sort of your ability to function in your professional uh, and personal lives. And what you see here is that the two top ones uh, are dysthymia, which is sort of a low-grade chronic depression, uh, and major depressive disorder. Uh, so again, this is really, I think, important to study. Uh, because it's going to have such a big impact and because it's so common. Uh, I think in particular, um, sort of being a, uh, a researcher of nonverbal communication, having a real interest in facial expressions in particular, uh, I think depression is a real um, you know, fertile ground for looking at facial expressions uh, all the way back to Darwin. Uh, and even before then, a lot of people thought about you know, the face of depression as carrying uh, some really important information about it. And uh, this is an old, um, illustration of uh, what you know, someone thought the face of depression might look like, uh, which is really, you know, you see sort of these uh, sort of grief, sadness type of expression uh, very strongly. Um, but to really start uh, researching this in a very systematic uh, way, uh, they started off by taking some videos of people that were depressed, people that weren't depressed, and then showing it to these untrained observers. They sort of pull people off the street, show them a video, and then ask them, uh, do you think this person is depressed or not? Uh, and they filtered out all of the sort of intelligible speech so that they were really just looking at nonverbal communication, um, which would be the face and gesture uh, and the prosody of the voice. And in fact, people were very, very good, uh, much better than chance, uh, without any training at determining whether or not someone was depressed. Uh, and then further studies actually found that 
Um, they weren't only able to determine if someone was depressed or not, they could even tell how depressed the person was. Uh, so again, I think this is really strong evidence that there's something going on, uh, you know, non-verbally that they can tell someone, even without training, a lot about, um, you know, the mood state of the person. Uh, so then later studies really wanted to get in this uh, and see what exactly is being signaled. Like, how are people able to tell if someone's depressed or not and how depressed they are? Uh, and the most strong findings, the most sort of robust findings, uh, is that there's a real attenuation of these positive expressions, mostly smiling. Uh, by attenuation, I mean uh, smiles occur much less frequently, and when they do occur, they occur much less intensely. Uh, so that's really, I think, the main finding. Uh, other studies have looked at more uh, what we think of as negative expressions, so expressions of like uh, disgust or contempt. We'll be talking about what those look like in a moment. Uh, some found that depression uh, had more of these expressions. Others found that it had less. Uh, it's very confusing when you go through this. It, uh, it takes a long time to really try to figure out what's happening. Uh, so I think more research on this is really warranted. Uh, that's part of what we wanted to do uh, in our study is take another more fine-grained look at this uh, try to figure out what's going on. Additionally, a lot of these previous studies have used a solitary context. And so what I mean by that is they would mostly sit down a participant by themselves in, in a sort of lab room and have them uh, look at pictures that are effective or watch a video that would be effective. Uh, and then you know you watch their face or videotape their face and then you code it and you see what is their face do in these moments. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, if you've ever been in a lab room alone, face doesn't do all that much. Uh, so you can look at you know what they do do and that can be somewhat informative. Uh, but I think that uh, it's really important to get people in, in a highly social context. And there's been some studies that have really found that uh, if you want to see what people do, if you really want to get expressions out of them, uh, put them in a social context. So that's what we're going to do in this study. Um, so here what we did is we had a group of depressed people um, who were diagnosed uh, with the skid, um, who really were suffering from you know, a major depressive episode that was quite severe. Uh, and we followed them over the course of treatment. And we took the ones that got better over the course of treatment, so we went from having high depression severity to low depression severity, and we wanted to see, as their symptoms went away, did their facial expressions, or did their patterns of facial expression change? And that's really gonna be the, sort of the main um, purpose of this study. Uh, so what we did was, you know, we had these 18, we actually started with more subjects, but not all of them got better, so uh, we wanted to look at the ones that did get better, so we had this sort of high-low comparison and we ended up with 18 participants, uh, 11 female, seven male. Uh, most of them were white. Uh, I think hopefully future studies can get a more diverse sample, but this is what we had. Uh, and the age was around 41 years. Um, uh, so we videotaped uh, the HRSD interview, which is this Hamilton semi-structured interview. Basically, you sit down with the participant um, and you ask them about the sort of the hallmark symptoms of depression. Uh, you know, are you feeling depressed? Um, you have these feelings of guilt that are sort of predominating. Are you thinking about suicidal ideation? There's a whole set of questions that you, that you ask them. Uh, and we, we videotape them with uh, a number of cameras. Um, we have two cameras here. Uh, the, this picture was taken from the perspective of where the participant would be sitting, uh, looking at this empty chair which would have the interviewer. So we have these two cameras here and here that are looking at the participant's face. And these are the real cameras that we're most interested in this study. We also have a camera that's looking at the interviewers. So maybe some further studies can look at the interaction between the participants and the interviewer, which I think would be real fruitful as well. And then we have a full body camera of the participant, so future work might look at gesture as well. Um, we would love to be able to have analyzed the entire video. So we have, again, about 24 of these questions. Uh, but <laughs> anyone who's ever done facial expression coding, knows that it's incredibly time consuming, especially if you want to do very fine-grained analysis, which we'll talk about, but we go quite fine-grained in this study. Uh, so it's really not possible to do this in any timely manner. So what we do is we uh, look for a thin slice of behavior. So we're not gonna look at all of the, the interview, but a subset that we select as being particularly interesting to us. So we take the first three questions for two reasons. First, because we think that these questions are very interesting because they're very salient for the um, you know, again, these hallmark symptoms of depression. Uh, but also because being the first three questions, this is the beginning of the interview, and again, studies have found that sort of at the beginning of an interaction is when people are the most expressive. Uh, so we really think this is gonna give us a good chance to, to get some real good data. Uh, so what we do is we want to look at uh, the facial expressions. Uh, and here across the top, we have uh, uh, six different 
sort of discrete emotions, anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, and sadness. And we want to basically see, uh, are the predictions of different theories of depression matching up with what we actually find? So if we go through this briefly, um, I'm going to talk about these five different um, evolutionary psychology theories of depression. Uh, there's other theories as well, but these are the ones that we went with. Um, and I'm going to just give a little overview of each of them. Um, it's going to be a bit uh, simplified, but perhaps afterwards during the question period, if you would like to hear more, I can uh, give a little more uh, explication for them. Um, so the first one is the affective dysfunction theory. And from an evolutionary perspective, it's really viewing the depressed state not as being adaptive by itself, or really being selected for itself, whereas the other ones will actually be depression as being selected for uh, and adaptive itself. But with affective dysfunction, it's these broad affective structures, so sort of the ability to have this range of emotion uh, that is really adaptive. Uh, you might imagine why that would be um, you know, very beneficial for us to be able to feel these different emotions in different circumstances. Uh, but what's happening in depression is that this adaptive system is sort of being dysregulated. It's not really working properly. And the way it's not working properly is we're getting a ton of negative affect, a lot of negative emotion, and very little positive emotion. And so what we should see is uh, a lot of anger, contempt, disgust, fear, and sadness, and very little happiness. And so again, we can actually look later and see, is this what depressed people show, uh, to have you know, a small test of this hypothesis. The next one is the resource conservation theory or hypothesis. Uh, which views the depressed state as an adaptive response to a low reward environment. So if you imagine there being a drought or a famine, something where sort of going out into the world and exploring or fighting or contesting, doing all the things that people do, uh, would actually be somewhat uh, wasteful because you wouldn't really be able to, in a drought or a famine, replenish those resources that you are, um, that you're using. So it actually would be adapted to sort of bring you home, have you stay where you are, have you not really react to anything for a period of time until that famine or drought can pass. And so what we should really see is this attenuation of pretty much everything, uh, where again you just sort of sit at home uh, like depressed people often do. Uh, the third one is the social competition hypothesis, which views uh, depression as really existing in uh, this social realm and serving a purpose in a social realm. This in particular views humans as sort of being in this very hierarchical, uh, sort of pecking order kind of structure, uh, where everyone's always sort of competing and vying for their place in society and sort of their access to resources that might be scarce. And depression, uh, according to this hypothesis, is really viewed as a response to losing face, sort of sliding down that ladder and losing uh, your place. Basically, if you're fighting someone, if you're competing for your place and, and you're losing, that can be very dangerous for you because the person that's beating you might take it too far and actually uh, morally wounds you or really uh, impair your ability to uh, continue existing. Uh, and so what you really need to do in that circumstance when you lose is sort of signal, I'm done. You, I'm no longer a threat. You don't need to keep sort of pressing your advantage. Uh, we call this sort of a de-escalation strategy. Uh, and so again, what this theory would say is that depression really shows submission. Uh, and so we should really see a lot of fear and sadness expressions, and we should not see these sort of high dominance emotions like anger, contempt, and disgust that would prompt more attacks. Uh, an evolutionary version of uh, the attachment theory um, really views depression as being this, uh, again, adaptive response to the loss or sort of a rupture in an important attachment bond. So your relationship with a loved one, with a parent, uh, something like that. And basically what depression is doing is when you sort of detect that this attachment relationship has been lost or ruptured, um, there's this great surge of uh, discomfort and sort of a distress signal that says, I'm very upset, please come back and comfort me, don't leave me, sort of repair this relationship. And so to signal this distress, we should see a lot of, again, fear and sadness and very little happiness. And then finally, the social risk hypothesis, very similarly to the social competition hypothesis, views depression as, ser um, excuse me, as serving this very social purpose. Views depression as uh, being this response to uh, basically the threat of being excluded from a social group. So again, uh, we humans are very social creatures. If we really need to be part of a larger group in order to have access to lots of resources and mates that we need to really be uh, reproductively successful. And 
uh, again, we should have these mechanisms that would sort of uh, detect when we're on the outs of the group. We're going to be kicked out of the group. Uh, that could be very damaging to our ability, again, to survive. Uh, so basically, that we should be able to have a response that sort of signals to the group, you don't need to kick me out. I'm not really a burden. I'm not a freeloader. I'm going to sort of do my own thing. I just sort of exist on the periphery, on the margins of this social group. And the way that you do that is by social withdrawal. It's sort of by signaling that uh, with anger, contempt, and disgust, uh, you know, sort of give me some space. I don't really want to be around you. Uh, and very little uh, fear, happiness, and sadness that would really be signaling I want something from you, either to sort of meet and join with you in a good way or to sort of ask for your help. Uh, so again, we have this sort of big uh, you know, table here with all these predictions about what depression might look like if each of these were correct for a given circumstance. So what we want to do is take one circumstance, again, this clinical interview, and see what does the face of depression really look like, how are they responding, and how would each of these theories really make sense of that. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, sort of form a little test of these hypotheses, again, in this one context. So we're going to actually be returning to this table later, and I'll plot underneath the predictions uh, what we actually see, and then give us a good test. Um, but first, we need to actually get from the theories to the, uh, to the actual emotions. Uh, I'm sorry, from the theories to the facial expressions that we're looking at. So we do that by looking at uh, you know, very long and fruitful um, program of research that is looking for these universal, um, you know, prototypical or um, yeah, prototypical expressions of the different uh, discrete emotions. And so here you see uh, the face of anger has sort of the brows being lowered, the mouth being pressed together. Uh, contempt has one of the lip corners being raised and uh, pulled together. Uh, disgust has you know the mouth uh, lips being raised and the nose being wrinkled. Fear has the eyes being widened, uh, the brows being raised, and uh, the lips being pulled back. Happiness has the cheeks being raised and the mouth uh, you know being widened in the sort of upward lateral motion. And sadness has the uh, uh, the lip corners being pulled down and the sort of a drooping loss of focus uh, in the eyes, as well as sometimes we find uh, the inner brow being raised. So these are, you know, again, based on research, what we should see uh, on the face in each of these emotional states. And so I wanted to sort of show that this doesn't only exist sort of in the research world, uh, sort of in the lab, and so I went through and I tried to find pictures uh, that you might be familiar with uh, that would sort of show each of these happening. So I found pictures of uh, President Obama leaving <laughs> certain expressions. Uh, so I think this is sort of also shows, it's sort of fun that I think to study facial expressions, because you're always, I mean, people make expressions all the time, you're always just that. Uh, so you see here he's making, you know, an anger expression, a disgust expression, fear, I'm not really sure what's happening in this picture. <laughs> it's probably an expression. Uh, happiness and sadness. Uh, and they're not perfectly matched up to the, uh, the prototype, and that's sort of why I wanted to include these as well but to show that they're very similar uh, with some slight differences. And some of those are individual differences. I find that President Obama doesn't really move his brows very often. I don't know if he said Botox or what, what that's about. Uh, yeah, but basically this is what's happening. I couldn't find, I looked really long for him making contempt, and I couldn't. I think he keeps that very under control. Uh, but I was able to go back a little bit further and get uh, former President Bush making a very strong contempt. So. These things do occur in the wild. Uh, so basically what we want to do is look for each of these expressions uh, and actually code them. And so again, if you remember back to the title, we're going to be getting evidence from both manual and automatic coding. And so first to talk about manual coding, what we do is, this is sort of the traditional psychological <coughs> way of studying facial expressions. So you take a video, you sit down in front of it for likely years at a time, and you, you know, invest hours and hours of, you know, painstaking work, um, you know, really looking at it and looking for these specific muscle movements. So there's one muscle that raises the inner brow or lowers the brows or raises the cheeks and so on. And what we can do is sort of cobble these together to make different expressions. So you might imagine that here you have a lip corners pulled in a smile and then you also have, uh, you know, the inner brows being raised. It might be like a concerned smile, something like that. Whereas you might have the same mouth but a different brow, sort of like angry, concerned smile. I'm not really <laughs> sure what's going on in that person's mind. Uh, but basically, we're looking at, again, these uh, nine different expressions that happen quite frequently and are sort of implicated in these different emotional states that we're interested in. And so I think that this is a really uh, 
quite a broad set, you know, again, these nine expressions. Previous research has really picked one or two of these and studied them. And I think that while that can be really interesting and rewarding to look at, it's limiting in some ways because, you know, again, based on how you combine these different muscles, it can mean very different things. And I think if you really want to understand what's happening, you need to, to get this fine grain. Uh, and in fact, we don't even stop here with these nine. We go further to get to uh, 17 expressions we look at. And we do that by looking at each of these ones on the outside combined with the middle one. So these different types of smiles. So again, you have a smile with the brows being raised, the brows being lowered. You can raise the lips as you smile. There's many things you can do. And the real reason that we wanted to do this is because, again, the most robust finding in depression in the past has been that smiles are changing. They're being attenuated. They're not happening that much, and they're not happening that intensely. So what we really wanted to see is, OK, we know there's something happening there. If we look at all of these different combinations, can we actually find out what exactly that smile looks like? Uh, and this hasn't really been done that much before, especially with this many combinations. So I think that's a really exciting part of this work as well. And to show you what that might look like, I have three examples here. We have the cheek razor being combined with a smile. It's a very intense, uh, happy expression. Uh, it's called the Duchenne smile, actually. It's quite famous. Uh, this is the, the chin boss being raised during the smile. And this is uh, the lips being pressed during the smile. So I wanted to include these two because it shows how you can have two muscles around the mouth interacting at the same time. And it's not just a simple, you know, the brow is doing this at the same time the mouth is doing this. They're actually acting on the same part of the face at the same time. And it's sort of this interaction effect uh, where the, cheek, uh, the lip corners are being raised in the smile, but then they're sort of being pulled back down a little bit by the, by the chin being raised. And so it actually looks quite different than a smile would look. Um, so that is how we do it with, uh, you know, the humans actually watch these videos and encode it with a computer program. Uh, it takes a lot of time, very grateful. We have one of our uh, putters here, Dean, uh, spent a lot of time doing this and getting very good at it. Uh, but ideally, we'd really like to be able to, you know, let Dean have a life outside of this. Uh, depending on who you ask. <laughs> it's not your point I like him in the lab more, but uh, you know, I, I would like to see him you know, do other things as well. And so you know, we'd really like to be able to do this automatically. We'd like to build a computer system to do this. And so luckily, we have some... <laughs> uh, I think you'll have a job for a while still, because we're still working on this. But uh, we'd like to have the computer do this. And so luckily, we have some really great collaborators that are really on the cutting edge of this computer vision, computer science field. Uh, that are really interested in working on this. And I've invested a lot of my own time trying to, I guess, be a liaison between these two fields. Um, and so what we do is, just like with the, uh, with the manual coding, we start with the video. Uh, I can't show you the actual video of the participants because you know, they were patients. Uh, and there's a lot of confidentiality rules. But this is one of the girls who used to work in the lab, uh, sort of posing. And this is what the video would look like that we first get. So she's in front of sort of a blue screen. Uh, it's roughly frontal. It's a little off-center, but it's almost frontal. And uh, yeah, and as she talks in the interview, we're able to capture her face. And basically what we do is first, for, in order for the computer to determine what facial expression she's making, we have to have the computer find where the face is. We want to make sure that it's looking here for facial expression information and not up here or something, not at her shirt. Uh, so what we do is we use uh, this sort of pattern matching system that looks for not just where the face is, but where these different points on the face are. So we're going to look for the brows, we're going to look for the jaw, <coughs> the mouth contour, the nose, and the eyes. And by finding each of these points, not just on one picture, but on every frame of the video. So video is just a series of images. If we do this for every single image, we're able to then sort of track how the shape of the mouth is, uh, not just the mouth, but the shape of the whole face is, is uh, changing. And so this is, you know, I think the most important uh, first step that we call tracking. So we're tracking the points of the face over the course of the video. The next step is normalizing. Uh, basically what we want to do is we want to be able to sort of compare um, different expressions in the same person. Uh, but there's many things that could change what the shape of a person's face look like that aren't necessarily related to expression. So her mouth might get much bigger because she's smiling. But her mouth might also get much bigger because she's leaning closer to the camera. And so we need to sort of uh, control for all of these changes in head pose. Um, and so that's what we are controlling for uh, pitch, yaw, and roll, which are sort of the head moving in these different uh, directions. And then we're also uh, correcting for scale. And we do that with this process called normalization. And so here, we sort of zoom in on the face. 
and we are sort of uh, working it back to being as frontal as possible. Um, and we do this both with the points that we're tracking, but then also with the image, we can work the image to look more frontal as well. And so this is, uh, I think, a very important step. Uh, and then finally, what we do is one final step where basically, again, we want to make sure that what we're looking at, what the computer is looking at, is the face and not other things. And so what we do is we actually cut out everything that's not the face. Because we don't want it, the computer to think that uh, you know, the hair is changing uh, you know, the contour or the texture of the face. Um, you know, or if she has a collar on, or let's say she was wearing a shirt that had a face on, or if there's a poster in the background, we want to make sure it's picking up her face and not the face in the background. Uh, so again, we cut out everything around the face. And again, I think that this is a really important step that uh, some previous uh, you know, attempts at this type of work haven't really included. Uh, and that's called masking. Uh, and so basically what we want to do is now we know where the face is, we've corrected for some things that we want to correct for, and we've removed some things that we don't want there. But now we need to determine what is the face doing? You know, is it smiling, is it frowning, is it disgusted? What is happening? And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to model this based on how the, the humans do this. Because if we look at this face, we look at it and we say he's smiling. In fact, he's smiling you know, quite largely, his cheeks are being raised. You know, this is a good smile. And that comes very naturally to us. Um, but actually, what's happening in our brain is quite complicated. So if we, if we learn a little bit about what's happening, then maybe we can model a computer system to do a similar process. So basically, what we look at is we say, well, how do we know that he's smiling? And so looking at this as you know, a facial expression researcher, I can look at this and say, well, I know he's smiling because his lip corners are being pulled. These uh, furrows here are uh, being uh, deepened in this sort of diagonal pattern. His eyes are being narrowed. There's these little wrinkles here around the eyes. And so basically, these are the features that I am using as a human to determine whether or not he's smiling. And so we want the computer to do the same thing. Uh, so we need to have the computer to uh, sort of determine what the different texture of the face looks like uh, you know, in this image. And so the way that the human uh, visual system does this is there are cells that respond to specific orientations of lines. And so you have you know, some cells in your brain that every time they see a vertical line, they fire. And the more vertical it is, sort of the more they fire. And then you can sort of have these other cells that look for slightly rotated lines, even more rotated lines, horizontal lines, and so on. So actually what we do is the same thing here, is you know, in the sort of computer version of this, instead of having these individual cells, we have these things that we call filters. And we have these filters, again, some of them are horizontal, some of them are vertical, and then we have uh, you know, a series of these, these eight filters at different orientations to try to you know, capture all of these different uh, you know, uh, textures. And then what we can do is we can look at each of these and try to find, just like the human visual system does, uh, where are these different you know, lines occurring. And so first, if we look at you know, where are the horizontal lines on the face, you might predict, well, you know, the eyes, especially like the eyelids, are uh, pretty horizontal. So maybe it'll detect those underneath the eyes. There are these uh, you know, furrows here, these wrinkles. Those might be horizontally detected. Uh, the inner part of the mouth is horizontal. That might be picked up. And so what we can do is we can actually apply this filter. And what you see here is this is the same vision of the face, uh, but where white is, so the lighter it is, is where this one filter that I have in red here, these horizontal filters are sort of being activated. So if you imagine in the, in the brain, if we could tap into those you know, horizontal line detectors, they would be firing probably in a very similar pattern. And so again, as we suspected, the eyes have some white around them. Underneath the eyes, there's some white. And then there's a bit on the mouth. So this is really you know, picking up this information. Now, if his mouth wasn't smiling, it might be actually a horizontal whole way across. And so we might see a wider area of white here. And so basically, we can start to sort of figure what your smiles look like in this space. Uh, what do other expressions look like? Um, but we're not only interested in horizontal lines, we also need to look for other types of lines. So to just pick a few of these, I'll show you what uh, vertical lines look like. Uh, again, there's not that many vertical lines on a face, actually. Uh, here we're picking up a lot. I think on his hairline, there's a big vertical line here. A little bit around the nose, uh, with these uh, parts right between uh, the eyes and the nose. And on the collar. So I think this is, again, another really, uh, you know, and this is strong evidence that that masking process where we get rid of everything but the face is important. This actually is picking up uh, you know, things like the collar. Uh, and then finally, if we look for, again, I think a big part of smiles are this, uh, you know, this furrow at a diagonal. So what if we have a, a filter at a diagonal? Will it pick it up? 
And so here we apply this filter looking for uh, you know, this type of thing. And sure enough, we have this big white line uh, here that's sort of picking up uh, you know, that there is this furrow there. And if you weren't smiling, this would probably not be there at all. Uh, so again, we're going to sort of be looking at all of these different orientations, trying to piece together you know, again, what is happening on the face. And so to show you sort of what the brain might do to then sort of reassemble all of this into this holistic image that we actually perceive, we can do the same kind of thing here, uh, where I sort of bring all of them together. And what you can see is it actually looks a lot like his face. You know, you can see his, his little, like, it sort of looks like a fro here. And, uh, you know, you can see that where his eyes are, where the nose is. And then you can see that the mouth has, you know, again, this, this, uh, you know, this white curve to it. And then there are these furrows uh, going around it. So a lot of the information that we really want to be pulling out of these images, we're able to. So that's really encouraging. Um, and then we, you know, sort of show a lot of these pictures to the computer and we say, you know, this is what the pattern of a smile tends to look like. We actually show a lot of examples of smiles. And it starts to learn, okay. If the face looks like this, it has these features, it's a smile. If it has these other features, it's not a smile. And we do this for all of those 17 expressions. Uh, it takes uh, you know, quite a bit of time. Uh, but then we're able to then give it a new image and say, what do you think this is? And it says, okay, well, on this new image, I see that there are these furrows, the mouth is curved, the eyes are narrow. It's probably a smile. We call that classification. And so then pretty much we have an automatic coder. And uh, we can compare that coder to the human and just try to see, do they, do, do they agree? If we show the same picture to both the human and the computer, do they both say it's the same expression? Uh, hopefully they do. Uh, and what we can do uh, first is just to sort of show, I want to show a video, just to sort of show again, like not just in images, but in video, how we do this over time. And so here you see in green, hopefully that's not too light. We're tracking the face, uh, not just, um, you know, one frame, but over time, even as he moves in these different orientations. Up here, you see that we're removing again that uh, rigid head motion of pose, uh, and then we're actually able to detect when he's smiling or not with these uh, with this graph here, uh, and we're also able to determine what his pose is. Uh, so that's like a little demo of uh, just what the whole system coming together would look like. Um, so how will this work? Uh, to get into sort of the results section, uh, here I'd like to show this graph. First, let's look at the blue bars. The blue bars are pretty much uh, a measure of what we call agreement. And so that's what we were talking about before. Let's show the same image to a human, uh, like, uh, like Dean, who's very good at uh, coding. And then let's show it to this computer that's been trained and see, do they say that it's the same expression? Uh, and this is a, it's a measure from zero to one. If it's up at one, that means that they're always agreeing. If it's down at zero, it means they're never agreeing. We'd like it ideally to be above this uh, red line at a point seven which is basically like the entry level where if you're a decent coder uh, you, in another coder code, we want to see that you agree around 0.7. Uh, and so if the computer can do this as well, then that sort of means that we've just built another coder. Uh, and what we see is that for all of them, we're very, very close to 0.7. Um, and so this is really encouraging. Uh, and I think this really goes to show that, you know, we're making great strides in this field. Uh, this uh, is really promising, uh, but also, I think we can look at these gold bars, uh, which is a different type of question. So instead of actually looking, do they agree on every single image, uh, which is actually a very difficult task, but if we look at just general patterns, so if not every single image, but if you look at the subject as a whole, if we want them to just make this more holistic um, evaluation of how often are they smiling or frowning or making this disgust expression, uh, we can look at how much they sort of are reliable on those more broad ranging, um, you know, classifications. Um, so here we have uh, much higher numbers. We're actually almost up to one. Uh, so it's almost <laughs> perfect on, again, this, this easier task of just picking up these more general patterns. And so for uh, many tasks, like the one that we're doing, we, we don't have to have it right every single time. We just want the general patterns to be right. Uh, and so what we see is that actually uh, we're very, very close to that. Uh, and I think this is uh, really encouraging. I think it really goes to show that this type of work is not only possible, but I think is you know, really ready to be rolled out for, for many types of applications. Uh, so that was I think, a really nice uh, finding. Uh, but now that we know that you know, the coders are sort of working well and are agreeing, uh, what, what do they find? What does actually the face of depression look like? Uh, so here we have, uh, for the overall expressions, we can look at you know, how often, uh, over the course of the whole section of the interview that we looked at, were the different expressions made. 
And so we have all of the uh, single expressions uh, down here, and I've got bar, uh, sort of boxes around the ones that were significant or trending. And so to talk about the ones that were significant or trending, um, we find that AU12, which is the smile, uh, was much less common uh, when they were severely depressed. So the gold bars are when you're severely depressed, blue bars are when you're not severely depressed. And what we see is that you know, there's only a 20% of the time where you're smiling when you're very depressed, but then when you remit, it's up to 40%, it's doubling how much you smile. So that's, I think, really encouraging because, again, there's been many studies that have found this type of finding before, so it just goes to show that, you know, again, we're able to replicate that. Uh, it's a bit of a proof of concept, I think. Uh, but we're actually finding additional things, too, which is exciting, sort of, <laughs> it makes the, some of this work worth it. Um, that there's some other findings, too. So for A14, which is this sort of contempt uh, lip puckering type expression. This is much more common. We're up around 25% when you're very depressed, and then that goes down to about 15% when you remit. And so that I think is, uh, you know, very telling that, you know, again, when you're very depressed, you're making these types of expressions like contempt, um, at least in this type of uh, social context. And then we actually find uh, this would be perhaps surprising to some people that. The rate of making uh, 15, which is this, uh, the lip corner is being pulled down, sort of like frown face, typically associated with sadness, actually was less common when you're more depressed. You might think that when people are very depressed, they're going to make a lot of these expressions that they're sad, uh, but in fact, they're making less of them. Uh, so just keep that in mind when we go back to return to that table again of the different predictions. How can we make sense of that? And then again, we wanted to look at the different types of smiles that are being made during these interviews, and does that change with symptom severity? And in fact, we do find two things. Again, AU14, this contempt expression, not only happens more frequently overall when you're very depressed, but when you're smiling, you tend to include this expression as well. And so even when you're sort of signaling you know, that you're happy or that you're being polite, you know, you're sort of, there's some contempt sneaking into that. Uh, so I think, again, that would be very interesting to start to think about what does that mean or why is that occurring? What function might that serve? And how might people interpret that? Uh, and also we find a very similar finding for A10, which is this uh, lip raise, um, very characteristic of disgust. That is also happening very frequently during smiles. So while they smile, um, you know, again, this disgust expression sort of sneaking in there. Uh, when they're severely present, that goes away when they remit. So those are the main findings, and I want to sort of show you a picture of the significant ones. So here we have a picture of uh, sort of uh, a smile, so maybe you know. It's basically if you see someone making a lot of this expression, it's likely that they're not in an acute depressed phase, if you're giving them an interview at least. Uh, whereas if they're making a lot of these expressions, again, a sort of lip puckering or lip puckering with a smile, they are more likely to be severely depressed. And so again, if you were to ask what does depression look like, I think that this is a uh, you know, very good um, you know, image of what that would look like. Okay, so then if we return, like I promised, to the theories, we have uh, in blue here all of the predictions that actually ended up aligning with the results that we found. So what you see is there's actually blue in almost all of these rows. So a lot of these theories are doing you know, somewhat well. They're making some accurate predictions. But there's also in red here, where there's actually the reverse of what was predicted was what was found. What you see is there's a lot of red here as well, especially towards the top. So a lot of these theories are sort of making some predictions that end up being right, and some predictions that end up being wrong. And in fact, the only one that has no incorrect predictions is the social risk hypothesis, which then sort of explains why the paper was titled Social Risk and Depression. Uh, because again, I think this is really where the action is, uh, that depressed people are showing much more contempt and more disgust during smiles and overall, and then they're showing attenuation, less happiness, and less sadness. So again, if we return to what is the story of social risk, how can we explain depression this way? It's really, I think, telling a story about social withdrawal. So social withdrawal we often think about as being this very market, I'm going to go home, I'm not going to go out with my friends, I'm going to sort of just hunker down and be alone. I'm withdrawing in a very um, elaborate way. But I think this also shows that when people are depressed, they're sort of withdrawing in a more subtle way throughout the course of the social interactions. They're sending these non-affiliative signals that I don't really want to get closer to you. 
And in fact, I would sort of like to, to have more distance from you. So if you think about depression, um, you know, again, we see a lot of people who um, don't really get social support from their peers. And I think this might explain part of why that happens. Oftentimes, there have been studies where, uh, let's say, a depressed person asks for help when they first have this onset of the symptoms. And their families and their friends are very supportive for a couple weeks, maybe a month. Uh, and then that social support sort of goes away. And that might partly be because it's difficult to continue supporting someone over time, especially when they're depressed. It could be grating. But it might also be that there's these social signals that you're getting over and over again that the person is not really interested, it's not very grateful, just doesn't really want to get closer to you. And I think that that could be very destructive um, you know, to your motivation to continue supporting them uh, you know, and being really close and connected to them. Uh, so I'd also like to thank here, uh, you know, again, this is uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration between a lot of people uh, made this type of work possible. A lot of people here, uh, Dr. Cohn, uh, Dean Rosenwald, and Sean uh, Zertovic are, you know, really uh, master coders. Uh, couldn't have done this without them. Nikki Sitterling sort of makes it all come together. She's our lab coordinator. Uh, Ellen Frank and Joan Butterworth at UPMC uh, collected the data for us, did these interviews. Uh, with their group, obviously we couldn't have done it without them. And then from University of Denver and Carnegie Mellon, uh, we had a lot of these robotics, computer science people that uh, were really instrumental in uh, you know, building these systems and sort of teaching me how to do all this uh, technical stuff. Uh, so thank you, and I'd like to open it up to uh, questions now. That's what we used. Um, but again, I think that part of it is uh, it is worthwhile, I think, uh, to again start building up uh, you know, the field's uh, information and, and knowledge about, you know, again, very fine-grained analysis. Because again, there have been studies in the past that looked at positive and negative things, but they weren't social, they weren't well-coded, they only looked at smiles, they only looked at the brows. Uh, it's very restricted. So I think that uh, ideally, future work would do this very fine-grained analysis of a variety of social contexts. Uh, but yeah, I think that this is really just supposed to be sort of a, a first stab at this type of work. Um, you know, at, in this, yeah, probably very negative um, interaction. I think that that might also sort of explain uh, what we see here where, uh, again, just the social context sort of influences the type of data that you get, the type of expressions that you see. That's, that's definitely unavoidable. So here we, we see that there's no difference with the anger and fear expressions. And that might be because there's no difference in depression in anger or fear. But I suspect it also has a lot to do with the social context, where when you're in an interview with someone who's you know, trying to get more information about you, there's just not a lot of opportunity to get and to show uh, you know, a lot of anger and fear. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a great question that um, you need to think very carefully about the social context when you do this type of work. Yeah. Um, so I work with Alan and Joan, mm. and I kind of came after this data was collected. But I was just wondering, across the, the 18 participants, mm. how many different interviewers were there? That's a great I, question. I, when, like, when I do mm. the analysis, I kind of different than other people. Like, mm. Some people will ask more questions to get at the same thing. Mm. Um, so like, some people will just ask, so in the past week, how depressed or sad have you been? Mm. But other people will ask. There's a difference in like the amount of time they're talking. Yeah, you guys are sharp. Uh, <laughs> I think that, that's very true. Um, I think just in general at Hamilton, uh, and really any semi-structured uh, interview, it's very, very fluid. Uh, and so I think partly that actually is a, somewhat of a benefit because you might get more variability in the data. But it also I think there's a cost to it because uh, yeah, like one person, one interviewer might uh, ask for much more detail than another one. Um, but also I think. It varies even within an interviewer with different participants that they're interviewing because if you ask someone, are you feeling hopeless, and they say no, you move on to the next question. Whereas if they say yes, then you ask for more and more information. So I think what you see is that uh, with these interviews, they range from like 10 minutes to 30 minutes. That's quite a big range. Uh, and so yeah, definitely I think that that has an effect on it. Uh, 
because we're selecting you know, a subset of that, we try to mitigate that somewhat. Um, but that, I think that is a very uh, an important point. Uh, I think that we did try to train uh, or use uh, you know, people who were trained with the Hamilton to sort of be closer. Uh, I wish maybe they'd been a little closer <laughs> to each other, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, but to answer your uh, initial question, I think that with the 18, there were maybe two different interviews. Do you remember, Nikki? Yeah. There were six in total, but again, we had a larger data set. Not everyone got better. So of the 18, I think there might have only been uh, two or three uh, different interviewers. Sarah. So to what extent do you think, kind of along the same lines as what Josh was saying, mm -hmm. but uh, that maybe you would have supported a different theory if the context of difference instead of being kind of almost like evaluated in an interview mm -hmm. as opposed to watching like a create film. Do you think you would still support like the social draw as opposed to some of like the impact of this one? That's a great question. Uh, I think that in terms of smiling, you do see the same type of attenuation, I think, across uh, these different contexts. But I do wonder, you know, again, like I said earlier, with these like negative expressions, there's a lot of variability between studies and between these methodologies. And I wonder if a lot of them might be driven by these different social contexts, where maybe you get contempt when there is this more evaluation. I, I wonder, you know, sort of what it's like to have a Hamilton where someone's asking you, you know, are you depressed? Are you thinking about killing yourself? You know, there might there may be a lot of occasion to feel contempt during that. Um, but what I think is important to note is that, you know, again, since we're comparing them within subject, it's the same person uh, having the same interview at multiple time points. Um, you know, sort of they have the same, uh, you think the same response. So the differences between them hopefully have to do with the depression severity, uh, not purely uh, the context itself. Uh, but yeah, I think if we had done, uh, you know, a different one, we might have supported a different uh, theory. But, so that's why I tried to be careful about saying that you know this is the data that we supported in this type of uh, circumstance. And I think that really uh, an important part of further research will be to really start um, you know sort of demarcating these different types of contexts and you know I think really fleshing that question out. Uh, is there a difference? And if so, what is it? But yeah, it's going to take a lot of time. Sure, Michael. Yeah, great, great, great stuff. It reminds me of an uh, old study by uh, Jim Coyne mm -hmm. on uh, he has uh, people listen, just listen to uh, depressed people talk and engage in some sort of conversation. And then had the people rate how alienated they felt mm -hmm. and such. And basically, the bottom line was people who were depressed turned people off. Right. Well, I think that there's a lot of interaction between, uh, you know, the different nonverbal channels. And so I think that, you know, with, when you're smiling, that changes the shape of the vocal cords, and so you get a higher frequency of your voice. Uh, when, you know, you're not smiling, it's going to be lower. Uh, and in fact, that's what you do find in depression. Um, and so, yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot of room for that. I think one thing that is really interesting as well is that uh, with, the, with the coin work, he's really finding that uh, depressed people are being very rejected by other people. And that sort of runs contrary to the social risk hypothesis, which is really saying that depression serves the purpose of minimizing rejection. So how do you make sense of that? And the way that uh, you know, the authors, um, Nick Allen, talks about this is that basically with low severity depression, it might very well serve that purpose of sort of ingratiating you back into the group, of like sort of existing safely at the margins of the group and not causing rejection. But that when depression gets really severe, sort of that adaptive benefit gets derailed. And then it actually becomes a bit too much. Um, so I think that might be occurring as well. Um, how do you think this could be applied like, even beyond psychology? Sure. Uh, do you mean, I'm assuming you mean just the facial analysis automatic? Yeah, just uh, the, the coding and. Sure. Uh, yeah, so there's. Um, you know, go to these conferences uh, that are in this interdisciplinary space, and they're doing some really fascinating things with this work. Uh, part of it is applying it to like education. A uh, big part of the field is trying to detect uh, sort of the two golden uh, aims are frustration and engagement. So if you can really detect with like a webcam on a laptop as a kid is doing math problems when he's engaged, 
then you might be able to know, okay, let's give him another problem, let's maybe give him a harder problem, and then when you start detecting, oh, he's getting really, really frustrated, let's give him a break or let's sort of uh, ease back the difficulty. Uh, so I think that education is one part of it. I think medicine broadly, there's been some work, actually, uh, Zakia, uh, who's in the back, has done some work on pain detection. Um, so that might be, I think, really useful where, you know, again, people can tell you that they're in pain, but you don't always know, are they actually in pain? And it might be nice to get another measure of that. And um, face could, I think, do that uh, automatically. Um, but yeah, there, there's many applications. If you want to talk more about this field, so I would love to uh, you know, hear your thoughts about what it could apply to as well. Yeah. Uh, either one of you. Oh, just kind of along with the applications, how um, time-consuming is the pre-processing mm. that you do for the processing? Uh, so I think there's sort of a, a trade-off here where um, sort of, I think it ends up being a net benefit, um, but basically there's a lot of uh, work that goes into uh, training these classifiers. Um, and you have to do, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of coding to sort of get to the place where you have a system that sort of knows what these expressions look like and can detect them. But once you have that, so now that I'm doing this, you know, it's like a breathe a sigh of relief. Um, now you can apply that very, very quickly. All you do is you feed it new images, and it'll tell you right away. Um, so really, you sort of front load the work. Um, so that, it's very frustrating when you're doing it, but once you're done, it's great, so. just sort of depression severity, but actually looking at different subtypes of depression. So are there people that have high anxiety and high depression? Do they maybe show more fear than the people that don't? Um, and so yeah, that, that definitely might have uh, impacted this. Specific. So social risk in particular uh, can actually look very similar depending on the context of other ones. So if you're in a competitive environment, social risk hypothesis actually says that you should do submission, just like social competition. Because again, you know, if you don't want to be kicked out of a group, you want to signal that um, not only you're not a freeloader, but that you're also not sort of uh, a competitive threat. So submission would, would serve that purpose. Uh, I think that in each particular instance, though, um, they tend to be somewhat mutually exclusive. Uh, again, some of them might overlap or subsume each other. Uh, like, for instance, the, uh, uh, if we go back to that really quickly, uh, oh, went a little too far. Uh, so here, the, uh, you know, the attachment, what I'm calling the attachment theory, um, you know, has very similar predictions uh, to, you know, like affective dysfunction. But effective dysfunction has sort of additional components. So yeah, I think that that might be one way to, to try to separate them. Um, do we have time for any more questions or? Maybe one last one. One more, okay. And thank you all for saying you coming so early, I appreciate it. I was just wondering how, uh, what led you to choose these areas as opposed to others? Uh, sure, yeah, so I just happen to have an interest in evolutionary psychology. Um, I don't know, I'm sort of a passionate person, my interests sort of drive me. Uh, so I picked these because, you know, I think they are, uh, at least according to my, um, you know, reading of, of, the, of the field, uh, you know, I think really the main uh, evolutionary theories. But you're right, there definitely are non-evolutionary theories, some of which sort of map onto one or more of these, but some of which might be quite distinct. Uh, so yeah, I think probably future work could really benefit from, I don't know, maybe trying to get a more exhaustive list of theories. Uh, is there one in particular that you sort of miss? 
Uh, no, I guess I was just, these were all evolutionary, so yeah. it's kind of, uh, that's why I asked. Uh, I was curious. Yeah, if, I'm sure if someone else had written this paper, that <laughs> many things would have looked different. That might have been one of them. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. And I'll be up here if you guys have more questions.